This is tonight, I'm Bruce Whitfield, and again, it's the middle of the day. Slightly overcast, so it's not too much of a shock for you. Welcome to Tonight with Bruce Whitfield. Tonight, we're talking to Grant Patterson. He's the outgoing chief executive of MassMart. Now, Grant Patterson is extraordinary for a number of reasons. He is the chief executive of MassMart, outgoing, retiring at 43. He took the job at the age of 36, which is a tender age by anyone's standards. So we're going to find out from Grant Patterson in a two-part series. Firstly, why he took the big decision at the age of 43 to step down and then secondly we're going to find out whether or not he sees any potential successes within this business plus i'm going to do some diy shopping as well at a brand new builder's warehouse it's very american and quite nice actually so Grant, when you make a decision in your own mind to quit well, how long is the process before you start telling family members, you start telling board members and you start telling everybody else that this is what you've decided to do? Um, I suppose once you've finally made the decision, um, the first person I told was my chairman. So yeah. the board is the first place to go once you made the decision. But I think it would be true to say that I've probably been discussing it in concept or in principle with my family and friends probably for a few months by then, maybe, maybe even several months. Well, what was the catalyst? What made you decide this is the point where Grant Patterson is now going to call it quits at the tender age of 43 as being a chief executive of MassMart? Um, I think it would be that I started to feel that we'd finished something. So, you know, there's been a lot going on. We've been mm -hmm. starting a new division, the Walmart deal has been done, the integration has been done. And I just started to get that feeling that my list had been ticked off and that either I must sit down and make a new list yeah. and write some new things down, or I must go somewhere else. And that was where the debate started in my mind. Okay, so and what is that? Is that a December 2013 holiday time sort of debate that's, that, that happens? No, I would say that it's probably... Why don't probably, you take the, take the road less travel? I'll you go to the chair. No, I would say that uh, it's, it's more that I'd probably made my mind up by my holidays, yeah. and I wanted to live it, you know, make a decision and live it see how you sleep, see how you feel. Yeah. I'd probably already in my mind made the decision before my Christmas holidays. Mm. So when you make a, a call like this, and it's a big call, I mean, you are, again, only 43, not to harp on about that too much. Um, it's also a case of calling it quits while you've still got time to go and do a second and like your, your mentor, Mark Lamberti, possibly even a third chief executive job. I mean, one of the things I've been talking about for years, and a lot of people are inquisitive about this, is, I did start very young. So I got my first MD job at 29. I got the MassMart job at 36. And now, at, and, and all through that time, everyone's asked me, so what do you do next? What do yeah. you do next? And I never really addressed it, but it's an issue. Um, and I think what happened to me in, you know, maybe call it a midlife crisis, is at 43, um, you've either got to do something now or well, I've got to commit to the industry forever. Yeah. I think either, either, either make a move or commit to the industry forever. You could have bought yourself a convertible, yep. um, but you chose to change careers instead. And the reality exactly. is you don't have a clue what the next job is going to be. In fact, I've been quite disciplined in not allowing my mind too much time on that issue. Yeah. Because I, I, I once learned um, from Ellen Not Craig talking about yeah. this. Um, and and I, I first need to get bored yeah. of being Unemployed. Unemployed. Yeah. Before I think I'm, I'll trust my mind and my decision making and my judgment to know what I want to do. How long does it take Grant Patterson to get bored? One week? Two yeah, weeks? Not, not very long. No, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I'll be addressing this issue <laughs> in June. Okay, you look at it in June. Because I, I did notice something a couple of months ago and I thought there's a change of pattern here because suddenly yeah, and there was a SENS announcement and Taste Holdings announced that you were joining their board. And I thought to myself, I need to give you a call and say, what's going what's on? About that, yeah. Because you, know, you are a committed full-time chief executive. There was a change. Was that part of the strategy of, of distancing yourself? Maybe subconsciously. I'm not going to deny that, that there must be some link. Um, that decision was mostly made because they asked. Mm -hmm. First person, by the first company ever to ask me to be a non-executive. You, you, so, so no one's you're ever cheap, asked. You're a cheap date, so you took yeah. the first offer you got. Exactly. Yes, okay. um, and the second thing is, because we had finished the merger. Remember, remember, I was very busy during yeah. the merger and after the merger. I started finding myself with a bit more time. Mm. And I also wonder about that because there was a period of time over the last three years where you've actually not been 
physically running the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of the business. You were spending time traveling between America and here, talking to regulators, dealing with unions, dealing with government. You were the integration guy, um, well firstly the sale guy and then the integration, integration guy, guy correct, yeah. with Walmart. Um, and it's actually been quite neat that Guy Hayward, the guy who's taking over from you, has had a couple of years to almost work himself into the job. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's pure succession planning. You know, I, I had the first idea that Guy was a good candidate and could do the job many years ago and so you know I had a discussion with him and said you know you, you can't be the CFO anymore you've done that job you're you perhaps the best CFO in, in South Africa or one of the best so let's give you something else to do and that was just part of the process of getting one getting him ready to do the job and perhaps more importantly getting him to figure out if he wanted to do the job. What, what's, why would you not want to do the job? It's an incredible it, being a CEO takes over your life. I, I, I've heard you do interviews with this and everyone says the same thing. Yeah. Is It's not a job and go home. It's 24-7, 365, it takes over your life. Your dinner party conversations change, your family conversations change. When I walk around on the beach in the holiday, people are stopping to do business with me, do consumer complaints. <laughs> uh, my children uh, have these, these discussions yeah. with people. So it takes over your life. Yeah. And so it's, it, it's not for everyone. So why then, if you've gone through it and you've done it, do you not then say, Right, I can now go and take five non-executive ships and spend a bit more time developing a golf swing or whatever it is you might want to do. Well, look, I, I live a balanced life, so I've, I can develop my golf swing anyway. Okay. Um, so now I've lived a balanced life. I don't need a break. I don't need a rest. Um, I, I, I love being a leader of a business, and I want to mm. do it again. Okay. Uh, I hope I get the opportunity. Mm. I mean, it, it's, and South Africa is skills has got a skills drought. Um, the homecoming revolution is bringing a whole bunch of people back. But the fact that Mark Lamberti, and no disrespect to Mark Lamberti, he's a remarkable individual, can become a chief executive for a third time at the age of 63, taking over the massive mm. giant that is Imperial, um, suggests that there are plenty of opportunities for people with executive capability. I, I mean, so I've observed that, and I'm hope that's true. You know, <laughs> and that, uh, that uh, it's that, a bit that, late now, really. <laughs> if it yes. Isn't, isn't it? Yeah. So yes. So, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that some opportunities will come my way. I'm not, I never have been much of a planner of my own career. I've got a philosophy that says if you want a new job, do the current one well, mm -hmm. and someone will offer you a new job. And really, I can only choose my future careers out of opportunities that are presented to me. And so, I don't, that's why I say I don't know, but I'll, I'll have a conversation with anyone at any time now. And if something comes along that I absolutely love, then I'll do it. You'll jump at it, yeah. I mean, what's been your biggest achievement? You look back at seven years, the Walmart deal is huge, you drove that. Um, when you look operationally though, at what people can actually feel and touch, this is you know, not a bad place. Yeah, you know, it's tempting to go back to things like that, but you know what, I can't even remember when, whether all that stuff was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, you know, a chief executive generally listens to, to lots of good ideas and picks the ones to back. Mm -hmm. uh, every so often I have an idea, um, Probably half the time, though, they don't work. No. Um, so it's difficult to do that. But what are the stuff I'm most proud of? Of of course, the Walmart deal. But I think you know enough has been said about that. Um, I'm incredibly proud of getting Masswant into food retail. Yeah. But probably the thing I'm most proud about is something that we don't talk much about. Is I, I was I, I proved again. It wasn't my idea. A graduate development program, um, where we hire 50 people each year out of university, and we turn them into proper employees and potential executives. I personally interact with all of them, I take personal sponsorship of that, and today I know that 350 people have been introduced into the workplace and are now working either in MassMart or perhaps somewhere else and they're going to be very successful. I want to talk a bit later maybe about how Mark Lamberti identified you and whether or not you've identified the next Grant Patterson further down the line. But, but for example, the Walmart effect, and if one wanders around a macro, if one wanders around any of your stores, there's no obvious change. I, mean, I think the changes are probably quite subtle. I mean, in this space, in this building, for example, this is a brand new builder's warehouse store. It's mm. enormous. It's probably one and a half to two rugby fields long. It's got everything that opens and shuts and machines that go ping and everything else mm. that goes with it. It's an extraordinary place. But there are things in here that for the, the lay person wouldn't even notice. Tell yeah. me about this place. Yeah, so, so that's, that's exactly right. Um, for the lay person, you probably wouldn't see anything. For a retailer, almost everything has changed. Okay, I mean, almost everything has been touched because of what we've learned from Walmart. This store happens to be a good example because it was just opened a few weeks ago. Yeah. So we have skylights in the roof, we have lights that turn on and off. We have a... So what, they, they rely on the, the ambient light changes, the lights will either come on or come off depending if it's cloudy or not, or whatever the case might Correct. be. Correct, and, and there's skylights in the roof, and that's, you know, it, it all looks quite obvious, but the technology involved is very advanced. 
Um, other things in the store, the, the type of floor has changed. Even the way we built this store, we've used much less steel than we would have otherwise, perhaps 20% perhaps cheaper in terms of steel. Um, but in the retail detail, there is things like, you're looking at prices here and you'll see that they're very bold, they've got no sense on them, and they're all one color. That's a Walmart philosophy that says so there's no, prices there's are no, one color. There's no one ninety nine ninety nine anymore. The ninety nines in here have gone. Yeah. Price statements are made clear. You see the the numbers are big. The font is consistent. Just look down this aisle. Yeah, I look at it. Yeah. It's red. Yes. Prices are red. Now, previously we were probably doing one price, uh, a promotional price in one color, and a normal price in another color. So we've learned stuff like that. Yeah. Um, there's products in here that we've bought through the Walmart system. Um, there is uh, merchandising um, philosophies that we followed. There is a reduction in packaging. So, I mean, if we look at this item here, this packaging that we've got here, see shrink pack, that previously had a big cardboard board on the back of it and lots of writing and all that sort of stuff. But we've reduced the packaging of this uh, significantly. It's better for the environment. You could, te you could teach Woolworths a thing or two about packaging. Correct, yeah. Like, so, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, we could go on and on and yeah. on, but almost every, th th these trolleys have been changed. Um, who we bought them from has probably changed, but their construction and design has changed. Yeah. Everything has changed. Is it possible to take a store like this off the grid? Is it possible? Yes, I, I think one day we will take it off the grid. The reason being is we have an enormous uh, area of this roof that collects water very efficiently and collects electricity very efficiently. Yeah. And perhaps even one day we'll be giving back. So we will... It happens in America where people sell power back to their, their, their local utility, yes. Now, do the economics work today? No. Does the technology exist today? Yes. And all we have to wait is for those to align. But you know, at the rate at which electricity prices are increasing, there's going to be a time where those two things switch. Yeah. Uh, we need to talk more about philosophy. We need to talk more about identifying the next generation of leaders. We need to talk more about all of that sort of stuff. I'm tired of walking. Our camera guys are going to crash into somebody and do them harm at some point. And we're also going to disrupt the shoppers and nobody wants to do that. Grant Patterson, the outgoing chief executive of MassMart, joining us on tonight with Bruce Whitfield. We're going to hit pause, find a comfy place to sit. And next time on tonight, we're going to get more of the insights from Grant Patterson as to what he thinks the future of this business in tales. This is tonight, I'm Bruce Whitfield. We're Builders Warehouse for take two of Grant Patterson. We spoke about his decision last time as to why he decided to step down, the process he went through, his achievements uh, running MassMart. Now, I wanted to have a bit more of a philosophical discussion because uh, you mentioned the last time we chatted all about the fact that you started this graduate training program. 350 young graduates have been through the ranks. Mark Lamberti, the guy who identified you as a successor to himself, saw you as a youngster, made you his personal assistant, grew you through the organization and when he thought you were ready handed over handed over the reins have you seen the next grant patterson amongst the 350 i have been following the same process um, so i've had several executive assistants over the seven years um, and certainly in those executive assistants i've seen some that could be the next grant patterson yes mm. uh, what, what character traits do you look for when you look in the management because you you and lamberti are similar in some ways but fundamentally different in others all the people in the shops i've ever asked tell me that um <laughs> uh, do you look for a sort of a mini me uh, no I, well i try to avoid that but there's obviously some natural bent that way no uh, uh, it's hard to say you know I, th I think that 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 word the x factor is unfortunately part of it. Yeah. You know, could I give you a list of things? Sure, but I'm not going to be particularly innovative in that yeah. approach. There's a, what I sometimes refer to as the lights on behind the eyes. Um, you must see it in the people you interview. Absolutely, yeah. Sometimes the lights are on, sometimes they all, they all. You off. either believe them or you don't. Correct, and, yeah. yes. And so there's the next factor. And you know, some of the times I think someone can do it and they haven't done it. And there's sometimes I've started off skeptical and they've got there. So, you know, I'm not a 100% um, success rate on calling this one either. Uh, do, do, you put, do you push the, the most talented individuals hard to see where their breaking points are, where they crack, how, how, they, how they respond under pressure? Uh, yes, I'm doing all of that to them. So sometimes you're hugging in them and giving them love because, you know, I think that the type of person who can be a CEO is often quite sensitive. Um, so sometimes you're having to, 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 to love them and have them. Yeah, no. um, CEOs need love. Here's yes. the headline. I've, I've got it. I'll remember it. And then sometimes, yeah, you, you're putting them on their back foot and seeing how they, how they respond and giving them challenges that are too big for them and you know, waiting for them to almost fail and catching them before they, they, um, they fall too far. 
Yep, you took over as chief executive uh, of this company when Tabo Mbeki was still president. You've most of your uh, chief executive ship here has been uh, under the Jacob Zuma regime. Uh, do you ever sort of get involved in politics at all? Do, do you have a political bone in your body? Um, so, uh, of course, in my personal life, I think about these things. Um, I mostly conclude that uh, politics is not for me. You know, it's it's it's. I do like a world which is sort of mostly straight talking and action orientated, that type of person Driven I on am. merit for argument's sake, yes. Yes, um, although, you know, some would argue that, you know, even in businesses they don't understand how the merit system works. No. Um, so I don't think, you know, governments or businesses are different like that. But no, I, I have the sense in me that, that I, I would struggle in this environment. I mean, I've been dipped into it somewhat in mass smarts. I've learned a lot and I've certainly had some good advice um, from people over the years. Um, and certainly, you know, at the moment, would be happy to say, you know, I'm worried. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, we were on a good track and we seem to have come off, off that good track and hopefully we can get back on it again. Uh, well, when you look at the business environment, though, has the business environment deteriorated over the last seven years since you took over as chief executive? Is it harder to do business? Do you find there are more obstacles in your way? Well, so you, you may be surprised by this answer, but, you know, actually business trust has declined and for good reason you know I, I think business trust in politics or trust in business no, trust in business yeah. people's trust in business has declined um, and and for good reason um, you know the financial crisis I don't think um, you know um, business came out shining particularly banking yeah. and perhaps a few other industries um, in South Africa I think we've had too much collusion too many companies caught mm -hmm. colluding I think that's fairly embarrassing to us all um, I, I'm not sure, I was saying to the other day, I'm not sure businessmen in South Africa, including myself, are trained enough in government relations. You know, so sometimes I've, some of the things people say embarrass me. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and so I'm quite cautious what I say because I, I, I don't want to emulate that. So, um, you know, I do think that, that we've got some ways to go in, 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 in defining business's role in society. And I think we've, business needs to step up to that. Is business sufficiently active? in the social dialogue, the political dialogue? I think some businesses are. You know, I think, I think it requires some courage because there's been obvious examples when, when businesses have tried to step a step forward, taken a misstep mm. um, and then get beaten back. Um, but I must say, I think, you know, I'm learning a lot from Walmart because the Americans are, are more used to business and government working together. Yeah. There seems to be, first of all, people move from business to government and government to business quite a lot. I think, by the way, that's what we should be trying to encourage in South Africa. Uh, it's happening a bit. I mean, you look at guys right. like Keto Gordon, for example, who's been in and out of government and business more times and than... And so, so Roman Poza yeah, is a good example. Absolutely. There. Yeah, and Tokyo Sokwali. Yeah. So it is happening more and I think that'll help um, to... to bridge that trust gap that probably exists both ways mm. between business uh, and government. Is the environment harder to do in which to do business now than it was seven years ago when you started? Yeah, so sorry, let me finish my train of thought. Is because of these failings in, the, mm. in business leadership, you might say, is there's been increased regulation. And so I can't argue with increased regulation, by the way, because it was somewhat earned. Yeah. <laughs> um, but business regulation makes things very difficult and is uh, the unfortunate consequence of actually protecting the incumbents. Now that, and, and this is what the problem is. And that, that is a problem because, I mean, it's like you, you ban smoking, you take brands off cigarette boxes as the Australians have done, and there can't be another brand of cigarettes to come and take on Marlboro or Camel for argument's sake. You essentially freeze dries yeah. the industry. You, you freeze it as it is. And so if you're in it, it's great. If you're out of it, you've got no chance of getting in now. Mm. And when you look at the dominance that you exercise in food retail, well, not yet in food retail, but you want to, um, but in household retail through, through macro and what you do through game and increasingly through Dion Wired and then in the DIY space with what you've done with Builders Warehouse, for example, I mean, do you feel like an oligarch? Do you feel like the Vladimir Putin of hardware, for example? Well, first, I've been so well trained in competition laws, I'm going to distance myself from the word dominance. Um, we are market leaders. <laughs> All right. um, so yes, we are absolutely market leaders, general merchandise, wholesale food and home improvement. And certainly there we realize we lead, read the industry and that there's some, you know, there's some, I suppose, um, pleasure from that. But there's also a whole bunch of responsibility. So, you know, the, the only way down when you're at the top, the only way when you're at the top is down. Okay, so you, you, you become a little bit insecure, in fact. Um, we are nothing in food retail. We're a three or four percent market share. Um, that's what excites me about the future of Mass Smart. You know, we've got great businesses that great, produce great cash flow and good profits. 
we need to spend some time consolidating and investing some of that in our future growth of food retail, which we've been doing, but that food retail business has massive potential. Mm. Is the future of business large, big scale, brash, American style, or is it just mass mart way, courtesy of Walmart? Yeah, we, we are just, I, I'm very much a portarian thinker of strategy. There are many successful strategies. Ours is the big box strategy. Is it the future? No, I just can tell you it's going to be part of the future. Mm. I think uh, for high service convenience offerings or specialist offerings, there's always going to be a role. Yeah. Uh, we, we spoke uh, touched briefly on what your, your future plans were. Um, you're not giving too much away. Is there an ideal job for Grant Patterson into the future? Yeah, I think I can describe that. So, um, you know, it's a international business based in Joburg and is South African. Um, you know, if I could tick all those boxes, if, if you gave me the absolute carte blanche, I'd say it would be nice to be unlisted. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you're unlisted, you've probably got a family business, uh, uh, shareholder. Listed, you know, you could have a majority shareholder or just a whole bunch of small shareholders. But you know, if it, uh, the, the listed pressure is hard, the public uh, persona is hard. I have to talk to people like you all the time. Well, I, I, which I would think would just be an absolute, that'd be one of the perks of the job, personally, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> when you look at something like Oscar Pistorius, for example, do you look at Oscar Pistorius and say, sometimes I feel a little bit like you without the gun? Yeah. Um, you know, because he's come under an enormous amount of cross-examination, an enormous amount of drilling. And as a chief executive, people think you're in charge, but you're not really uh, when it comes to shareholders and, and the boards, for example. Yeah, I mean, watching the trial, like everyone, we always interpret it through our own experiences. I do spend some time, prob probably more watching the experts than Oscar himself. Yeah. Um, uh, receive their questionings uh, from both sides and certainly what goes through my mind is this is very much like what the chief executive goes through as I have to now talk to all the various journalists each looking for their own angle and their own story then going off to talk to the, the analysts who are all trying to prove that their forecasts were correct um, whether whether you've overachieved them or underachieved them and then going out to actually talking to your shareholders who've got some real rights to, to mm. ask you some difficult questions and very much of the techniques I see um, um, used by the experts and the prosecutors and the defence witnesses are sort of the techniques that I've had to learn over the years. Um, and, and their cross-examination, I mean, is, when you look at the board interaction, for example, the board should be putting you under Harry Nell type pressure, does it? Exactly, I should have included them as well, because yeah. a, a non-executive director's role is very important there. It's, you know, you've management, you've formed your thoughts, you've presented them to us and you've uh, open them to critical review and now you're going to get your critical review and it's not personal. Do they do it well? I, they do it very well. Hey, you know, we have, I mean, we have some very sharp directors on our board, um, both Walmart directors, mm. appointed directors and our own, and you've got to be on your toes in those meetings. Those are the, the highest pressure meetings I have. Are you glad that those days are over for now anyway? No, in fact, I love it. So, so if you had to tell me what was the most exciting day of my seven years, yeah, go on. it was the day I testified at the, tri the competition tribunal where I was there with five senior counsels, each looking at my statement, asking me questions for a day, trying to put me off my guard. It was the highlight of my um, experiences. I like this stuff. So uh, you, you enjoy things like that, going to the dentist and other unpleasant experiences? <laughs> no, I like everyone else, don't like going to the dentist. <laughs> no, there we go. So that, now we know how to put pressure on you. Uh, the next five years, we, we see Grant Patterson take on a new career. Do you ever see yourself retiring? Um, I think the concept of retirement is dead, but that's not to say that I think the concept of working until you're dead is, is, mm. is uh, also particularly valid. Um, I've been working with a couple of our senior executives who have are advanced in experience and age, and I've tried to work with them that their role must change. And so let me talk about, we've got a guy by the name of Joe Owens in our company, and he was running one of our divisions, yeah. then he was advising me at head office, and now he's an external consultant to our pay per day. Whenever I need something, I phone him and ask him to do it. And he can now control whether that's one day a month or 20 days yeah. a month. I think you can keep your relationship with your company far beyond your retirement age, um, and you can continue to work with them. Guy Haywood, one piece of advice, the one thing he cannot afford to get wrong, or well, the one thing he has to get right. What would that one piece of advice be? Well, if I reflect on my first period, whether it be half a year or a year of taking over a mark, despite the fact that I was very close to Mark, um, some of the things that I thought he was doing wrong when I was working for him, I changed immediately when I took over, and almost invariably that was wrong. And so my advice would be to, to say, just because I've done something you think is wrong, doesn't mean what you're going to do necessarily is right. Yeah. You may be right I was wrong, but even the thing that you think fixes it may also be wrong. So take your time, 
um, and, uh, you know, uh, go slowly and go cautiously. That was your Donald Rumsfeld moment. Uh, Grant Patterson, the outgoing chief executive of MassMart on leadership and the way in which companies are managed. He's got a success in the name of Guy Hayward, once the finance director at MassMart, who's now the chief operating officer. He very well soon will be taking over the big job, the big job of being chief executive of MassMart, answerable to shareholders locally, unions locally, government locally, but ultimately also to the mighty Walmart in the United States, which controls this business. That's been tonight. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Thank you for watching. There'll be more tonight tomorrow. Till then, bye-bye.